Good afternoon from AccuWeather.com. I'm meteorologist and social media coordinator Jesse Farrell. Uh, we hope to have Olga from Google, who moderated yesterday's chat, on in just a few minutes. But meanwhile, I can get us started. Um, if you have any questions about weather gadgets or weather stations and electronics, um, go ahead and post them to our Google event page, and I'll be monitoring that occasionally to answer any questions that you might have. So, let's see here. Um, as you know, AccuWeather is celebrating our 50th anniversary this year. Um, certainly, weather technology and instrumentation has come a long way since then. Um, these days, a person is able to do, go online and purchase a weather station for a couple hundred bucks, which uh, is nearly as good, at least good enough, um, to emulate what the National Weather Service has at their airports. Now, of course, they have specific um, instrumentation there that's very expensive and very quality controlled and has a lot of maintenance done to it. Um, and their weather observations, therefore, of a much higher quality. But if you just like to know what the weather's doing outside your house or business, then it's fairly easy these days to go ahead and set that up. Um, but before I get into the home weather station discussion, I wanted to talk a little bit about um, devices, gadgets you can have in your home that will give you the weather forecast. Now, AccuWeather is involved in a couple of these, and um, since the advent of cell phones, I suppose these aren't as useful as they used to be, but um, especially for... Uh, a Christmas gift, um, especially if you're looking to give an electronic gift to someone who's maybe not as computer savvy as uh, you are. This is a great way to plug in, uh, plug and play, I should say, and basically be able to get the weather forecast right off of your refrigerator, for example. Now, AccuWeather's partnered with a company called Ambient Weather, and this is an example of one of their devices. Um, what this does is it actually shows you a four-day forecast um, and the data is delivered from AccuWeather.com over uh, the old pager network. So you do have to be with, within range of the uh, pager tower and these are sold by Brookstone and if you go to their website you can get actually a more updated version of this. And there is a coverage map there. Like I said, you do have to be within the range of the actual cell tower to deliver the pager signal to it. Um, it gives you four different locations. There's a button on the side of it to switch from location to location. So here's um, State College. We have State College, Johnstown, Erie, Pittsburgh, all of the uh, local cities around AccuWeather. And again, it gives you the current conditions as well as the four-day forecast. And it's magnetic on the back, so you can literally um, stand this up at your desk or just stick it to your fridge. It's a great way to um, answer the kids' questions about what they need to wear today. Um, simply refer them to this little gadget. Now, in addition to that, there's actually a larger version of this, which is sold by Bushnell. And this also has the data delivered over the pager network. Um, just like the small one. Uh, the good thing about this is that since it plugs into the wall, it does have a nice LED light on it. And instead of just having four locations, it comes configured with 150 locations, and you can scroll through them with the button on the front. And now notice that each time I change the uh, button to a different location, the actual LED color of the display changes, and that's based on the current temperature, which is shown here. Um, and this has a seven-day forecast, today plus six days. Um, and once again, you just select your cities from around the nation. There's really no setup for this. Um, you basically plug it in, uh, let it acquire the pager signal for a few moments. And <clears throat> after you do that, then you've got your weather broadcasting in your house. There's no computer required for any of these. All you need to do is just plug it in, and, and it works, which is pretty neat. Um, I also brought with me this strange looking cube and I miss I have managed to lose the AC adapter for this so it's not very exciting but 
Um, this was an earlier version of the same kind of weather gadget for your house. And all with this one, all you do is you literally plug it into the wall and let it sit and engage with the pager network, and then it starts glowing. Uh, it starts glowing a different color depending on the current AccuWeather real field temperature outside, which is pretty neat. And if there's going to be precipitation, the light inside pulses. Um, now, I thought this was a really neat device, and I really, I really uh, enjoyed playing around with this. But I think in the end, I'm not sure that um, these are even sold anymore because I think in the end they didn't sell as well. And the reason for that, I think, is that people are so accustomed to seeing a weather forecast displayed on a grid with four or five days at a time that I think for the most part, without, with the exception of the uber, uber tech geeks like myself, I don't believe that... Um, the cube ever caught on because it was it was too simple and and, and it makes you do too much thinking. Um, we do have a question from Google Plus here. Let me pull this up. Um, discussing the home weather stations at a few different price points. I'll definitely get to that. Um, they want to know about the accuracy of the tilt bucket electronic rain gauge relative to a Coco Ros gauge, which I can explain, and instrument placement, which is a big problem in urban. Uh, suburban neighborhoods where things can be obstructed. That's actually a great point. Moving away from these inside weather stations that tell you the weather forecast, moving on to your outdoor weather stations, if you are going to place a weather station outdoors, you definitely should make sure that it's away from objects uh, that might cause a problem with the readings. For a rain gauge, you want to make sure that the unit is uh, what we learned in college was H over 2, and what that means is take the height of all the nearby trees or buildings, divide it by 2, and take that number away from your rain gauge. So if you have a 10-foot tall tree, you need to make sure that tree is 5 feet from your rain gauge, um, just dividing the height by 2. Um, so that's definitely, that's definitely something you need to be worried about for your rain gauge. Um, if you have wind equipment, the standard height for that, um, according to the National Weather Service, is 30 meters, or excuse me, 30 feet, which is 10 meters. Um, so ideally, you want to get your wind equipment uh, up that high and away from all obstructions if you want to get near official readings. Um, if you're going to put it up on your roof, you're going to violate. You're pro probably going to violate that 30-foot rule, but it's better to get it up above the roof and above your neighbor's roofs so that it doesn't. Um, cause the wind to be blocked in a certain direction. I'm going to share my screen now and show you a picture of one of the weather stations that we're looking at today. And so this is your typical um, this is your typical home weather station. This is actually the Davis Vantage View weather station and I have this this actual piece of equipment with me today. Um, this station sells for just under $300, and uh, depending on where you get it, you might be able to get a little cheaper, maybe $250. Um, it's, it's a very reliable model. It's made by Davis, um, who is a company that primarily makes weather equipment, um, and I think for that reason they have better customer service and uh, better quality equipment. Um, this is the actual piece of hardware right here. So if you want to get a weather station, this is what you're going to install in your backyard. And this is actually a very compact piece of equipment compared to the way things used to be. And yes, you'll notice there's a uh, anemometer cup missing because I accidentally dropped this one, unfortunately. But um, that's kind of the standard for outdoor weather stations. And uh, in the old days, weather stations were very hard to put together. Um, a lot of steps to install them and to uh, configure them. A lot of batteries involved, uh, solar power was tough, everything was wired, um, but these days everything is wireless and you literally just mount this on a pole in your yard and it, trans it has solar power, uh, there's the panel there, and then it transmits um, about a thousand feet line of sight into your house into a console which looks not unlike the devices I was showing before which gives the actual readouts uh, from the weather instruments. Now, 
for the uninitiated, this is the anemometer here, which is the wind equipment. And the anemometer cups catch the wind, spin around, and then a magnet inside transmits the uh, speed of the turning in, in, inside to the uh, console. And underneath we have a, the temperature and humidity sensor. Again, this is much smaller than they used to be. You wouldn't have been able to hold this in your hand 10 years ago. Um, this is in a special encased uh, uh, little casing here that keeps the sun off of it because you don't want the sun to shine on it. That wouldn't be official. And it also protects it from um, other harm from insects, uh, mold, and that sort of thing. And then f the final piece of this is the rain gauge, which is this uh, large part on top. Again, very much smaller than it used to be. Actually, if I can uh, unscrew this, I'll show you the inside of the rain gauge. Um, rain gauges typically were made out of what's called uh, a tipping bucket. Um, but what Davis has done with this particular gauge is they've turned it into a tipping spoon. So once one one hundredth of an inch of rain falls into it, this little spoon inside tips over and that tells the equipment that some rain has fallen and it counts those up to determine your actual rainfall. Now somebody asked the question, is this going to be as accurate as a Kokoroz gauge? And what a Kokoroz gauge is, is the National Weather Service has um, a program that you can become a part of where you officially observe rainfall from your house. It's done in a very simple plastic uh, rain gauge that's up to spec for the National Weather Service's uh, requirements. And that's always going to be your most accurate way of measuring rain, um, as long as it's placed properly. Um, you're probably not going to get that accurate of a reading from any sort of electronic rain gauge. So if you're in the Kokoros program, you are required to use one of those old plastic gauges. But for the most part, for daily use, the electronic weather sta <coughs> stations can gather rain data fairly well. Um, Actually, the most likely thing to screw up your rainfall with these gauges is that something could plug up the hole, um, insects, leaves, um, that sort of thing. That's the most likely thing that would cause your electronic gauge to fail. Uh, let me just take a look and see if there's any additional uh, questions here. Again, hopefully um, we'll be joined by Olga from Google in just a moment. Um, so the next question is, okay, so I've installed this in my yard and it's successfully transmitting into the house now. Um, I've got readings on my console, so now what else can I do with this data? Well, the answer to that is that you can fairly easily uh, transmit that data onto the internet. And I'll show you how. Let me again share my screen here. Uh, for this particular station, there is a device which is called the WeatherLink IP device, and I'll show that to you. And what this is is a, a very simple, easy to use device where all you need to do is just plug in um, your Ethernet cable into the box there and then plug that into your uh, router and it will automatically send out the information um, to the internet and I'll show you a couple of places where that's going to show up. Let me just see if I can get Olga into the chat here. Hold on. The advantage of uploading your weather station data to the internet of course is that um, not only will you be able to keep an eye on it from home and work uh, all the time, but you'll also be able to contribute to uh, what are called meso networks out there. And the meso networks, um, especially the National Weather Services Network, which is called um, CWOP, Citizens Weather Observer Program, um, once you're able to transmit your data to that, then everybody on the internet can see it. The National Weather Service can use it. Um, Commercial weather services such as AccuWeather can also use 
that data um, to power their current conditions and forecast observation databases. And you can also get a look at weather conditions from other backyard stations uh, in your area. Well, let me pull up a couple examples of that. So I've hooked up uh, my WeatherLink IP station at home. And what I get for that is this screen, which is uh, at weatherlink.com, uh, which is Davis's website. That little device transmits the uh, weather data once a minute to upload it to this uh, website in a nice little, nice looking format. And then the other thing that it does, uh, once you configure it to upload to the CWAP program, um, the weather data ends up there on a map. And let me show you an example of that. This is pretty neat. All right, let me share this window. So now what you're looking at is actually a Google map of the weather stations in Center County and here in State College, Pennsylvania, which is home to AccuWeather headquarters. So if I zoom in here, you can take a look. Okay, there's the weather conditions from my station at home. And here's the weather conditions from AccuWeather, where I've also installed a uh, very similar weather station on the roof here. And so you can zoom in and out, and the official stations are on here as well, because this is National Weather Service um, website. And you can see the official stations here. I can see the observations from the airport. Uh, but I can also see all these other observations from my local uh, area. And I see we have Google, uh, Google with us now. Olga, how are you doing? Hi, Jesse. Nice to see you. Well, we've just been going over some uh, basic weather gadgets. And um, we kind of split up into two parts. We just talked about uh, gadgets like this that you can uh, independently download data without a computer through the pager network to these devices. And we also just started talking about how to put a weather station in your backyard, which is this beast right here. Oh, my goodness. So you're going to run right out and buy one of these, Olga? Of course. <laughs> <laughs> Except I live in an apartment complex. It would be kind of hard to have that in the backyard. <laughs> yeah, it can be challenging. And we talked a little bit about siting the weather station um, because you have to put the rain gauge uh, in a place where it can receive all the rain and you have to keep the wind equipment away from um, obstructions as well. But you can, um, that's all to get uh, near official readings. You can still have some fun with the weather station um, even if you're not able to put it to the official specifications. So what kind yeah, so, of... So how do you do that if you have an apartment? Because I know that, you know, not everyone lives in a house. So some people have townhomes, some people have apartments and or condos. What's the best way to set up the station in that instance? If you have an apartment or a condo um, and you're not able to access um, any ground space to put up the station, you can attach it to your uh, porch or deck. Okay. Um, but you, you will have to be aware of that. You'll probably get some heat off the deck, which may push the temperature up unusually high and you probably won't get as high of a wind reading as you would if you had the station on the roof. But a lot of people still still install them just because it's fun to see what the weather's doing there at, the, at their location. So you just account for the one to two percentage error or I mean how many percentage errors do you think it would have? Um, it depends. There's there's ways there's ways to mitigate it. I mean, the ideal weather station is the ideal thermometer. I should say is supposed to be placed six feet above the ground, okay. on top of a, a grassy area. Um, but you obviously want to avoid things that are going to give off heat, like air conditioning units. Keep it far away from those. Um, black top or any sort of black roofing is going to increase your temperature significantly. If you're just going to put the station out on a on a wooden deck, um, uh, the station is somewhat sheltered. I mean, the temperature sensor is inside, inside this thing here, and it's meant to kind of shelter it from some of that uh, extra radiation. So you're not going to get a huge difference if you put it out on a wooden deck. And, you know, I don't know if you went through this already, but can you show us each of the components of that little weather station? So yeah, sure. Um, 
this is actually the anemometer here, um, which ca the cups catch the wind, and uh, there's a magnet in there that relays that information uh, to the weather station to let it know how fast it's spinning, basically. Okay. And on the bottom is actually a fairly typical, I'm covering up myself here, but a fairly <laughs> typical wind vane, okay. um, just like you might see on top of barn. So that spins around and tells you the direction. Rain falls into this uh, large circular area on top and drains down into a special device, which is called a tipping spoon. And there's, there's literally something that looks like a little spoon in here. The rain falls oh, in there, cool. and then when it gets heavy enough, the spoon tips, and again, that um, lets the station know that uh, a smaller amount of rain has fallen, and then it just counts those up over oh. time. That's great. And you, can buy all these, you can buy all these things individually, too, but um, these all-in-one stations are, are certainly a lot of fun for the weather enthusiasts and uh, meteorologists out there and for some of the uh, more hardcore weather enthusiasts in the public as well. What, now, where would you actually purchase one of these gadgets? Um, you can purchase them just about anywhere online. Um, Amazon has them. Um, there's a number of smaller websites that deal exclusively in selling electronic weather stations. Um, they do vary in price quite a bit. I would advise against getting the cheapest one that you can find, right. um, which is always, always good advice in the electronics world, I think. <laughs> um, this one that I'm showing here is uh, between two and three hundred dollars, but it's a very, it's a very solid investment. It's not likely to break. Um, Davis, the company that makes it, um, for the most part, makes only weather stations, so they have uh, real good customer support. Yeah, and I, I was actually going to ask you that now. How durable are these weather stations? Because one would only assume that if you live in some severe weather areas, um, you know, it has the potential to break apart. Uh, they're actually pretty durable. I've I've run various versions of these at my house for five or ten years, and they've been okay. I mean, things happen like they can't ice over in the winter. Um, you're not going to get. Um, Something that you should be aware of if you live in an area where there's snow or rain is that there's um, almost no way to get reliable rain readings in the winter because the snow will stick in the gauge, not drain through, and then when the sun comes out, it will drain through and make it look like it's raining when it's not. That's one thing to keep in mind if you live in, in that sort of area. But unless you're going to position it um, in a really destructive area like um, the coast where it's going to pick up a lot of sea salt and uh, corrosion and that sort of thing. These things are pretty reliable. Okay, that's great. And so do they connect to, I know that one of the instruments that we had discussed previously, they connected to your computer and you could actually download um, the stats and look at it, I guess a historic, a historical uh, reading of how the weather's going in your town or your area. Yeah, we actually, um, let me show you the device that I showed a moment ago. Um, sure. It's even e easier than that these days. This is um, the Davis Weather Link IP. Oh, and wow. And there's, there's actually a, a f whole computer in the little box there that's about the size of a quarter. And uh, wow. you just plug that into your Internet router, and then this, and this device transmits the weather data up to Davis's weather site um, once a minute to uh, give the updates. Wow, so then Davis is essentially like an aggregator of, um, of weather forecasts, is that correct? Of weather observations, yeah. Weather observations, okay. Yeah, um, as they sell these things throughout the world, uh, people connect them up to the internet and that goes to their website and you can optionally register for the U.S. government's uh, what's called a meso network, a network of, of weather stations over a small area. It's called the Citizens Weather Observer Program, and when you connect to that network through the configuration of the WeatherLink IP, your data also goes there, and the National Weather Service and commercial companies like AccuWeather use that data to um, improve their observations and forecast databases. Wow, that's fantastic, I, and I think that actually leads to a, a good point here. Um, I know we've discussed this in previous Hangouts, but now how much information do you actually use from the public and how has that influenced um, the way that, you know, with the use of technology now and people being able to report their forecasts um, or at least transmit their data, 
how has that influenced y'all's forecast? Yeah, the data is the data is a big help because um, meteorology in the 1990s um, is based on was based on observations from very reliable equipment through the National Weather Service, uh, mostly at airports. But we all know that the weather changes over a very small area, so having these additional uh, meso network stations um, gives a better picture of what's happening right now in the weather. And if we can get a better picture of what's happening right now, then that um, sort of input goes into the computer forecast model algorithms that predict the weather. Um, right. So the, the more data you have that's coming in uh, reliably allows for better forecasts in the end. And certainly when observing things like hurricanes, I know that, um, and even tornadoes, um, the denser observation network um, enables people to report on the weather and meteorologists to um, observe the weather much better because um, those types of systems try, it seems like they try their best sometimes to hit in between the weather stations that are the official stations. So when you have these uh, amateur stations as well, um, I know that there was a point during Hurricane Sandy um, at which the highest wind gust that was observed was actually from one of these citizen weather observer stations because they just happened to be placed in the in the right area to receive the highest winds where the official stations uh, weren't nearby. Right. No, that's fantastic. So, so there's really like an entire community starting to develop as far as citizen reporting. Yeah, it's, it's kind of its own uh, social network, I suppose you could say. Um, I shared this window earlier, but let me show it again for your benefit, Olga. Sure. Um, this is the uh, National Weather Service's Citizen Weather Observing Program plotted out on Google Maps. And each one of these little dots is a weather station. And so if I click the one here, it shows the data from the weather station at my house. And you can show additional graphs and historical data and that sort of thing. Wow, that's in fact, fantastic. We just, so we and just all those dots are individuals? Like they're not... Yeah. Yeah, I mean, if I zoom into um, State College, which is where AccuWeather he World Headquarters is here, um, there's one station that's the official airport station out here at the University Park Airport, but the rest of these stations are individuals who've wow. put these up at their houses and transmitting the data. Now, somebody asked, um, we had a question that said, where can I find uh, these meso networks from my area? And if you Google meso west, um, they're the, uh, it's a, joint venture between uh, university and the National Weather Service to display this data on Google Maps. So if you go into their site, you can drill down to your state and city and location, and you can see these different uh, weather stations around you. That's fantastic. And, and I, I guess, you know, utilizing Google Maps and these different um, mapping programs, you can actually see physically where everyone has positioned their their stations. That's awesome. Some of these networks too, actually, uh, there's some some folks on these networks that um, on CWAP that are even yeah, what's mobile. CWAP? Uh, that's the Citizens Weather Observer Program. Oh, uh, that's that's the acronym, huh? <laughs> yeah, there's actually some uh, mobile folks who are uh, have a weather station on their car. Some storm chasers do this that transmits data. Um, over, I think, over the ham radio network. Um, so there's actually a few mobile stations amongst uh, amongst these. Yeah, and that's actually a great a great point. Um, I know we talked about these stationary weather stations that you put in your house. What what other kinds of weather stations can you have? Obviously, you just mentioned the ones on your car. Um, can you give us a little bit of background on the ones on the car, and then you know, like another two examples of other kinds of what weather stations? Well, sure. I mean, um, the weather enthusiasts out there like myself have tried all kinds of crazy things. Um, you, can you can install these stations on cars or boats, uh, for okay. example. Um, there's a number of projects which are underway, and the city escapes me, but there is a city who has attached weather sensors to all their city buses. And oh, wow. Attempting to... Um, conglomerate that data into some sort of a mapping system. I'm not sure what the status is on that. It's been a few months since I've heard about that. 
but um, the thought these days is that if we can find any network that we could place a weather station on, we can do that. And I mean, this is your this is your typical home weather station, which again is a lot smaller than it used to be. But we're getting to the point where weather stations, um, maybe not terribly accurate ones, but weather stations that do record and transmit some sort of data are becoming smaller and smaller, so they can be applied to to fleets of things like buses and, and cars. Wow. So how, how large would one of those weather stations be? Um, I think the ones that they were putting on the bus network were probably not much bigger than your wallet. That small? Yeah. I mean, everything's getting smaller and everything's getting cheaper in electronics, which is great. That's and that's cool. really what's allowed, allowed this kind of thing to, to blossom. Um, 10 or 20 years ago, if you wanted to do what you can do today with these weather stations at your house, you'd probably pay 10 times as much. And it would be, uh, um, even in the early days of the Internet, it was, it was very, you had to be a super um, computer nerd to be able to hook one of these things up to the internet but these days it's pretty much just plug and play which I think is great because the more weather stations we have online from people the um, the the better we'll be able to measure what's going on and again at the coast I mean I can't say enough about um, if you if you have a house at the coast or know people that do certainly recommend that they install one of these stations because when the hurricanes come in uh, the more observations the better Right. And some, on a related note, somebody asked about um, how these types of stations are powered. Um, this one has a solar panel on it, um, so it's completely solar powered and wireless. You don't need to run power to this, um, which is good for lightning safety purposes. Um, I had a, in the 1990s, I had a nice, really nice weather station that was wired in. In other words, I had to run wires from the station itself through the window into the house, into the um, computer. And uh, lightning struck my uh, oh antenna my pole that they were mounted on and lost a weather station and a computer that night. So <laughs> wireless is good. Wireless is definitely good. But um, something else to think about, too. Um, so, this, so this part's sitting outside and it's transmitting wirelessly to a console inside your house, which I meant to bring one of those with me, but it doesn't look a lot different from one of these devices I showed earlier. It's okay. basically an L. LED or LCD display of the weather conditions. It's like an iPad. Um, yeah. Um, something I would recommend if you're going to get one of these and you're, and you're pretty hardcore about it is um, the uh, console on the inside, um, make sure that you keep batteries in it because in the case of a power outage, um, it'll continue to record the data on the console inside. And if you're crafty enough and say maybe you've hooked up your uh, cable modem and um, router to uh, UPS battery system, um, you could keep transmitting weather data as long as that UPS holds up because unfortunately in meteorology some of the the most important data comes around the time the power goes out. <laughs> <laughs> that would make sense. I think we saw that with Hurricane Sandy. Now I, I'm curious, so I think very similar to the way that we see online with our social data, um, how secure is your data via these weather stations? Because clearly you can actually have a pin on a map that will actually show your location and as well your location is linked to the data that is being transmitted from the weather station. So can you address the privacy issues? Um, certainly. Um when you set up the weather station and you, des and you decide to transmit it to one of these networks, it's really up to you to um, put in a specific latitude and longitude point. Okay. Um, so it's not like you're putting in a street address, um, which would, would be very specific. It's simply a latitude and longitude point, and obviously okay. the less digits you take that out, the less accurate it is. Um, so, I mean, having the city where the station is located is better than nothing. Um, but the more accuracy that you're willing to give to the location um, helps. Absolutely. But it, all in all, your data is pretty safe and you, you do tend to be, I guess, anonymous. Except yeah, that. yeah, yeah. It's really up to you what level of, of detail you want to give when you're 
um, when your weather station reports to these networks. You can be really specific and, and say it's in this neighborhood at this flat lawn or you can be vague and say it's, it's in State College, um, but I don't want to say where it's at. It's, it's still helpful. Yeah. So how many people in AccuWeather do you think have a, have a weather stations at home? Is this well, like a cool, cool kids club? <laughs> yeah, I have to admit most of those dots on that map were uh, from our meteorologists, so you may not uh, get we're quite a, a, as, <laughs> most of them, yeah, um, but certainly a lot of our guys um, do enjoy being able to see exactly what the weather is doing at their house. If there's been a big windstorm that's come through or really cold temperatures, um, when I come into work, every, you know, everybody's comparing the numbers and even people who don't transmit over the internet are, are bringing their numbers in and say, hey, I had, you know, 20 degrees this morning, what did you have and that sort of thing. So it's, it's a lot of fun in, in a company like this. That's awesome. Um, if people wanted to learn more on how to set up weather stations and what, you know, the right kinds of weather stations to buy and ask questions, do you guys have a resource like that on your website? Um, yeah, they can they can uh, visit my blog. I'll, I wrote a entry last year fairly detailed on how to set up a home weather station, and I'll post a link to that on my uh, Google Plus page and on the AccuWeather.com Google Plus page as well. Yeah, that would be fantastic so people can learn more. Oh, we have another question here from a viewer. Sure. Um, they're asking, have weather stations played a role in misreported information? If people are setting them up, up in areas that might give inaccurate readings, um, similar to how people say bank thermometers are typically incorrect, and is that a concern with citizen reporting? That certainly is, and and um, both the government mesonet, the CWAP mesonet, and any commercial weather company that's that's ingesting this data certainly do have to be careful with the quality control of that and be a little more stringent. Um, when you're processing the data, but I think people have kind of gotten used to that over the years um, to make sure that the data going into the uh, database is, is, is good data. Um, the CWAP people themselves do a quality check on the data um, so that if you're ingesting this into a database, you can, um, there's a flag for if they think something might be incorrect and, and they maintain accuracy statistics on that as well. And they do that by making sure that the, uh, the temperature reading or, or wind speed or whatever is not way off from surrounding locations because you can right. always look at what's happening around you and, and get a pretty good idea if um, the readings are off. I don't think I've heard of any situations where somebody's um, malevol malevolently transmitted bad data. Um, most of the time it's it's more accidental that something's wrong with the station or it's or it's yeah. cited incorrectly but just like we were talking about yesterday with the uh, hoax photos on social media it's certainly something that you need to be aware of as as um, you know if you're if you're a reporter and you're looking at these amateur station readings you need to keep in mind um, that they could be inaccurate it's, it's certainly an issue absolutely well, I mean, it, it sounds like there's quite a bit of information out there as far as being able to install your weather station and the, you know, the data that you can actually transmit to these larger institutions like the MESA. Did I pronounce it, or am I saying this correctly? The MESA. The MESONET, yeah. MESONET. And that one is part of the National Weather Service or the U.S. Department? Yeah, I think you mentioned uh, it's a it's a joint program between um, uh, University of Utah and the uh, NOAA National Weather Service. Okay, okay. And uh, and you showed us a couple of different things. Can you show us again so we can get a good recap of the different instruments? Uh, that sure, you sure. Have the here? first thing we the first thing we talked about was um, weather gadgets for your home, like this one that. Um, receive the weather data from AccuWeather.com over the pager network and this one comes pre-configured with 150 cities that you can scroll through and then the LED display changes based on the uh, current temperature at the location that changes colors and you get a seven-day forecast on this device and this is sold by Bushnell. Okay. And then the smaller version of that which is a four-day forecast is sold by Brookstone. All and right. 
just battery power, just magnetics. You can stick it right on the refrigerator and when the kids ask you the question in the morning, what should I wear today, say, hey, just check that out. <laughs> I love it. <laughs> um, so those are the, the types of gadgets you can get for the home. And, and those can be really good. Those can be a good Christmas gift for um, maybe somebody in the older generation who wants access to the weather forecast all the time but doesn't want to have to turn on the TV and find it, doesn't want to have to get on the Internet and try to find it. Right. Um, but, you know, I... One thing we haven't mentioned today, and I pro and I definitely should have, is that um, obviously your cell phone, your smartphone, can be a good source of of uh, weather gadgets and information. Um, I know you can't really see this, but this is the uh, AccuWeather.com app for Android, and um, it Looks it obviously like it's going in the clouds. Yeah, it has a fancy little display where it takes your current <laughs> conditions and converts that to an animation, kind of a screensaver. Oh, um, fantastic. At least on this uh, Verizon HTC Resound phone that I have, but uh, we do have AccuWeather.com applications on uh, almost every smartphone out there. Um, we have a, a really good application on the iPad, which has some unique displays. Um, and you know, if you have those kind of gadgets too, you can certainly take the weather with you uh, in those ways. Right, I think right. probably in the future, those um, smartphone applications are going to become more and more uh, prominent, easier to use, and um, that's probably going to be the wave of the future. I love it. That's, uh, that's one of my favorite lines from The Aviator. <laughs> <laughs> um, okay, and the larger weather station, can you just show us that one again? That one goes on in a backyard, ideally. Right, this is your backyard weather station. Um, this is between two and $300. Uh, you can get them cheaper, but you're probably not going to be satisfied with the uh, set, the ease of setup and the reliability. Okay. Um, you can get them for more than this too, but it's really not that worth it because, I mean, you could buy a station that's thousands of dollars and really in the end, for the end user, it's not going to make that much difference in, in reliability or accuracy even. Right, right. So the mid-range is probably the best. Mm-hmm. Okay. Perfect. Yeah, it looks like we have one more question. Um, Wonderful. In terms of historical data, will having this extra information help us identify trends in the future? Um, certainly it will. Um, when you talk about things like climate change, though, you want to be very careful to use stations that you believe are very accurate and well-maintained. Um, so I'm not sure that these amateur stations are ever going to find their way into uh, the climate uh, climate change databases, although um, if you ask uh, a friend of mine, Anthony, who works for uh, surfacestations.org, um, if you ask him, many of the government stations that they use for climate change are not uh, well placed or functioning correctly either, but that's a whole other story. <laughs> um, <laughs> Certainly for um, cases where you need to look back at data and determine um, what happened in a specific situation, um, these stations can be very useful. Um, again, provided that you believe the data is accurate, we have a forensics department here at AccuWeather. Um, I think we just did an infographic with some AccuWeather stats for our 50th anniversary, and I think one of the cases, or excuse me, one of the stats was that our forensics department has done 10,000 different court cases over the years. And when it comes down to the forensics guys, um, they're going to look for every possible piece of data that they can um, to prove something in court for somebody. So if there's an amateur station, even if it can't be necessarily certified, they're definitely going to take that into account. Okay. And I mean, if, if you've had um, an accident or a slip and fall or something at a particular location, then obviously these networks being so much more dense than the, the government network um, that started it all, that can be very helpful when you're, you're looking back at uh, historical data. That's fantastic. I mean, it just sounds like the advances in technology have really helped to give you guys a better and more accurate way of being able to tell us about the weather on a daily basis or even on an hourly basis. Absolutely. Um, I really, I definitely um, credit the uh, drop in price in electronics and the ubiquity of the internet as um, reasons for the explosion in uh, 
the weather enthusiast community over the last 10 to 15 years. That's awesome. And plus, I mean, even within these, you know, the Discovery Channel, I know the Weather Channel has some awesome shows that, you know, I mean, everyone loves the weather and being able to see it on a daily basis, you know, when you're actually at home chilling out after a long day of work, it's, it's pretty cool. It makes everyone want to be a, a meteorologist. You guys are like the new rock stars. I guess so. The new, the new science rock stars. <laughs> <laughs> well, you know, the fact that um, being a geek seems to be more uh, acceptable these days in Hollywood uh, doesn't hurt either. So. Absolutely. Well, I know that this week is still full of a lot of exciting things that are going to be happening for AccuWeather's 50th anniversary. Can you tell us a little bit more about what's going to be happening over the next few days? Sure. Um, for anybody who wasn't in yesterday's hangout, we are celebrating our 50th anniversary here at AccuWeather. Um, serving weather data to uh, the public and commercial clients during that entire time, radio and television stations, um, hundreds of those, hundreds of newspapers. Uh, we've just been doing it all uh, over the years. So for the 50th anniversary this week, we are doing these uh, Google Hangouts every day. Um, yesterday's was on social media and the weather. Today's is weather gadgets. Tomorrow's is storm chasing, the history of storm chasing. We're going to have several prominent storm chasers on talking about that, which I'm sure a lot of people will be interested in. Um, Thursday, we look back the last 50 years of how weather forecasting and presentation and data collection has changed here at AccuWeather and some of the advances um, outside of AccuWeather, like radar and satellite, um, how those have helped us over the years. And then Friday, we take a look at the future of weather and we try to answer the question of what is meteorology and uh, weather going to look like in 10, 20, 50 years down the road. And uh, we also are running a photo contest on AccuWeather.com's Facebook page this week um, where people can enter a photo of how weather has affected them and have a chance to win a uh, gift certificate from Carhartt. Wow, that's fantastic. It sounds like there's a, a lot of things to celebrate this week. And for all the weather enthusiasts out there, they're going to get to see the whole breadth of what the, uh, the weather reporting industry is like. If you bear with me a moment, let me. I meant to bring this picture up earlier, and I didn't. Sure. Um, to give you an idea of from whence we came at AccuWeather, uh, we've obviously been digging up a lot of old photos, videos, um, articles and that sort of thing for the uh, 50th anniversary and this is actually let me screen share this sure we'd love to see it this is an article about our founder and president Dr. Joel Myers in uh, 1957 in wow. the local newspaper and he's got his own little weather station in his backyard there. So you could do this kind of thing 50 years ago, but it was a lot harder. Um, he, had to, he probably had to buy the um, instruments from a scientific sales catalog. And, um, Is that how people ordered back then with catalogs? Yeah, I think so. <laughs> um, but then he's, he's got his little uh, bedroom office here where he's, he's uh, teaching his brothers who uh, help him run the company today. Uh, about the weather. So that's just a quick example of uh, the kind of history that we have here at AccuWeather for um, observing the weather. So, you know, the, the people that founded this have been um, enthusiasts for over 50 years, huh? Absolutely, absolutely. Wow. I'm sure they've got some great perspectives as far as how much meteorology and weather reporting has changed over the, over the course of the past, you know, few decades. Yeah, I think we'll hear some great um, stories and insights on, on Thursday and Friday about that at the, in the Google Hangouts. Awesome. Well, I'm very excited. Thank you so much, Jesse, for, for, uh, for hosting this. We're excited about AccuWeather's 50th anniversary. Thanks for teaching us about these really cool gadgets. Um, and it sounds like it's accessible to anyone, so it's just a matter of going out there and purchasing it. And, and we do have information as far as like following up. You're going to be sharing that article on Google Plus as well as your blog. Um, would you like to uh, to tell us where we can find more about you and AccuWeather? Sure. Um, AccuWeather is active on all the social networks, um, including um, Google Plus, Facebook, Twitter, even Pinterest and Instagram. 
And um, if you have any specific questions about weather gadgets or weather stations, you can contact me, uh, Jesse Farrell, on Google Plus or Facebook or Twitter. And um, we look forward to hearing from you. Awesome. Well, thank you so much, Jesse, for having me. Again, my name is Olga, and I work with Google. And um, yeah, we're excited about the rest of this week. Let's, let's keep the weather going. All right. Thanks, <laughs> Olga. Thanks okay. for tuning in, everyone. Of course. Bye. Bye, everyone. Thank you. Bye. Thanks.